by the Word, the Word of God, okay? And so some of this is going to be repeated multiple times. It needs to become um, who we are. We need to understand our inheritance. We need to understand what has been made available. And uh, the Word repeats this stuff over and over and over again. And I think once your eyes start being um, enlightened to this, every time you open the Bible and you read in the New Testament, you're going to... It's going to be impossible to not see it, but we first have to see it. Um, I'm just going to start in 11.1 here. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And at the end of last week, I kind of expanded on this, that right now, now faith and I gave you a uh, scripture, um, Hebrews 11.3, or 1, three, the, ex the express image of his person. That and substance comes from the same Greek word. And so now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the express image of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. And it says, for by it, or for by faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that th the things that which are seen were not made of things that which are visible. I want you to see faith in this manner. Faith is a gift, okay? When you was born into this world, you operated under a worldly faith. I'll give you a quick example. Most of you know what a doctor is. Right? Everybody can understand and relate. You go to a doctor, and a doctor gives a, uh, a testimony, um, a diagnosis. We'll call it a testimony of this is, this is what's going on in your body. That's what they're testifying to because they have a worldly understanding that this and this equals this, whatever, whatever equals that, that testimony, that diagnosis, okay? And... Oftentimes, whenever the, the word cancer is given, there is a sense of hopelessness that tries to attach to it, okay? Why is that? Because worldly faith understands that this is a, a death that is in the body. Does that make sense? And so there's this expectation, okay? It, there's a faith and an outcome of a worldly knowledge, if you will. But godly faith... Is something, it's a gift that he has given to you, okay? He has given you his faith. It tells us in Romans 12, 3, that he has dealt to each one the measure or a measure of faith, depending on the translation you're reading, but he has dealt this to you, okay? Through what Jesus done on the cross, um, you have become a new creation, something that has never stepped foot on this, in this earth or in this world prior to you have been made new. You've been given a new heart. You have the mind of Christ. But you are a new creation. The faith in which you live by or should live by is not the worldly faith, but a godly faith. It's not a matter of whether you can do it or not. It's a matter of whether you choose to or not. Does that make sense? Because this faith was a gift. He gave each one the measure or a measure. It was a gift. If you choose not to live by faith, you have the right to do so. Does that make sense? The church, and this is kind of what we've been bringing all this from, um, has had this way of preaching the cross, which is great. It's a message that is needed. But then continuing to take the body back to the cross and back to the cross and back to the cross, back to the cross, rather than teaching them how to live from that place. Okay? And so faith gives us access to these things. And so, for by faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. If the doctors give a, a testimony, a diagnosis, okay, it is a truth, but there is a greater truth which we are to live by. This truth trumps the truth of this world. 
This is your reality as a child of God. But you choose whether you're going to operate in it or not. You have that right. Does that make sense? It says, for by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are, which are seen were not made of things which are visible. God has given us the ability to operate from a third heaven standpoint. Man now reigns, if you've been following over the last several weeks, man reigns from the right hand of the Father, okay? And we're really going to bring this home here in a minute, but it has to be established inside of us that you, all right, having accepted Christ, okay, are seated there with him. Ephesians tells you this. You might know it here, but it has to be here for you to operate in it. And that's why I'm repeating some of this stuff from week to week to week, okay? It says, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he, that, so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him for before he was taken, he had, his, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. That should be the testimony we all want to search after, right? That we all want to have. But it requires something. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. That word is that he exists, that he fulfills, that he is the beginning, the end, that he is, and combining the two together, not just that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This is something that you must believe in order to access these things. You're able to do so by faith. So, Flip over to 1 John 4. Save your spot. Everywhere we go, save your spot. We might be bouncing back to it. Flip over to 1 John 4. And I want you to see something here. We're going to, it's not a real long chapter. It's like 20 verses. We'll probably read through most of this. But this must believe part, hold this close to your heart as we're going through all this tonight. Because We preach love, and sometimes there's a common message that goes out, and we miss what the Word's telling us. I want you to see what's taking place here in this, in this, in this chapter, and why it's saying what it is. 1 John 4, I still see pages flipping, so I'm going to wait, but I, uh, I think that this part right here is so beautiful. I want you guys to really study this week, this, this chapter. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. All right, you ready? Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is what? Of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has, has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. Which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because why? He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Christians operate a lot of times, and I'm using this word loosely, but they operate in this manner of I am a sinner saved by grace. I love this ministry because it preaches an understanding that you were a sinner saved by grace, okay? 
as a whole, the body of Christ needs to understand who they are in him and who he is in us, okay? Because we are not, we are to no longer fear. Does everybody understand that? We are to no longer fear. This is recorded multiple places in Romans 8, in this chapter in multiple places as well. But we are to no longer fear. Hold on to that. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, it keeps going. It doesn't just stop there. He's talking about being able to discern and to tell the spirits that are godly and the spirits that are of error, okay? And it goes on and it says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Love is not God. Okay? Okay? God is love, but love is not God. Love cannot be God. God can be love. I'll give you an illustration. I'm a taxidermist. Okay? That's what I do for a living. However, a taxidermist is not me. I would be confined, 100% defined by what a taxidermist is if a taxidermist was me. Does that make sense? But I'm much more than a taxidermist. God is much more than just love. God is love, and it goes back in here multiple times and tells us that God is love, but love is not God, and the world is making love a God. And they're missing it because love is not God. However, God is love, true, unconditional, agape love. Understanding and knowing that it says In this, the love of God was manifest towards us. In this, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. I want to stop right there and I want you to capture something there where it says that we might live through him. So, in this, the love of God was manifest towards us. In what? That God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That's in what? That word live, I'm going to butcher this, zahoy, the best way I know to say it. Greek 2198 is the verb of zoe life, which is Greek 2222, the noun, if you're taking notes and you want to write that down. That you actually, it's the verb, it's the action that you live. The love of God, that unconditional love, was that you might live. Is that not beautiful? I want to keep going. It says, in this is love. Not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He sent his son to appease the wrath that God had towards sin. That propitiation is to appease that wrath. That's why it tells us in uh, Romans 5, at the beginning of 5, 5, 1, 5, 2, that we have peace with God. Because Jesus came and was obedient and fulfilled the law and it appeased that wrath. It gave us a place to be able to stand because that wrath was carried out. I heard a a, a minister sharing a story and this maybe will help illustrate what a propitiation did or him being that propitiation, what it done. Justice cries out. We learn this with the blood of Abel. Even after he was killed, his blood continued to cry out because of the righteousness, because he was righteous. 
And there's a story, I haven't been able to find this, so it might have been a make-believe story, but whenever I heard it, I heard, you know, about the time frame, and so just go with me that it's a make-believe story, but maybe it'll still tickle your heart, right? Um, but this king had a kingdom, and um, it became pretty corrupt, and things were coming unglued inside of his kingdom, and he wanted to establish some foundation back within his kingdom and within his officers and within the people. And so he declared that if someone was, you know, caught in the act of bribery, that they was going to have to take a hundred lashes. And in that, they, he, he spoke this, he declared it, they went out, they proclaimed it across the kingdom, and the very first offender was his mother. And so his officer brought the mother, and he was like, what do we do? And justice was crying out for the fulfillment to be carried out. But love was crying out all the more because this was his mom. But justice has to be fulfilled. It has to be. Otherwise, there's no foundation. And so the king gave the signal, and they started giving her her lashes across her back in a public place. And whenever they got to five, the king raised his hand and said, stop, I can't do this anymore. And so he walked down there and took off his shirt, and he said, give me the other 95, and they counted them out together. Because justice has to be fulfilled, otherwise there's no foundation. Does that make sense? And so Jesus fulfilled that wrath. He appeased the wrath of God. Does that make sense? It has been carried out. Justice has been served. He took that for you. Why? That you don't have to. But the Christian community, at least the big majority of it in America, is still walking around, broke down, walking in condemnation, and not accessing the throne room, which we read for three and a half weeks, what Jesus made available to where we have access and we are to live from the holy of holies. Does that make sense? Because the church has become powerless because there's a lack of knowledge and truth of the word being given. And we'll move on. It says, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It says, no one has seen God at any time. If we, if we love one another, God abides in us. And his love has been perfected in us. Pay close attention to that word perfected. It says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us. Because he has given us of his spirit. The ability to have unconditional love is a characteristic that is of God that we should display. However, if we operate in a manner to where it, the unconditional love is our nucleus rather than Christ being our nucleus, we start to get a, um, a disoriented view of who we are. It says, and, as, and we have seen... And testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. All of this is relating to the spirit of error, the spirit of God, and what God has done, what God has made available, how he has poured out his love, his agape love to us, that we might live through him. When we accept Christ, when we understand the power of the cross, Christ crucified, we understand that power. That is where the Christian community should begin living life. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed. You have the ability to believe. This is something that you generate. You do not generate faith. Faith was a gift. But you generate Believing. 
Does that make sense? You have the ability to believe, to, you choose to believe or not to believe. That's something that you generate. This is something that you put forth, like to think a thought, you have to, inside of your mind, put forth effort to generate a thought. Does that make sense? Same way whenever it comes to believing. You choose this. It says, the, the love that God has for us, so you have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. See it there again. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected. There's that word again. Among us in this. You ready? We all talk about the love of God. Love has been perfected in this. That we may have boldness. Some translations may say confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. The day of judgment, that you have confidence knowing who you are. Why? Because Jesus done paid the price for your shortcomings. You have a confidence in him, a boldness that you are to live at the right hand of the Father. You are to live in the Holy of Holies. This is your access. You have been given access, granted access through his works. Through the works that Christ accomplished. And when the love is perfected in you. This love that God shared with you, it is perfected when this becomes understood. Just as he is, there's that word is again. Just as he has always existed, that word is is also I am. Just as he is. So are we in this world. See how I, I love how it puts that in there. So are we in this world, not so shall we become when we leave this world. So are we in this world. This love that it's talking about is telling you who you are, where he has placed you, because what his son done was enough, because that's how he chose it to be set up. And because the spirit of the Antichrist or the spirit of error is in this world and you understand who you are in him and who he is in you, he says, therefore, there is no fear in love. Whenever you understand this love that you are being perfected in, there is no fear in this love. You do not have to fear condemnation. Judgment has already been placed on that sin. If you have a heart for the Lord and can get to a place to repent when you mess up, agree with the adversary quickly while you're in the way, Jesus has done it. He did not die in vain for me. And it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. You want to walk in the fullness and the understanding? Understand where you are placed. Learn to look at things from a third heaven view. It tells us that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. You're going to suffer things. But they're not bigger than you. People are going to say things about you, and it's going to hurt. His testimony is greater, but you have a choice. Which one are you going to believe? Which one are you going to let control what takes place inside of your mind? He tells us also in Romans 12 to renew your mind, not to be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind in order to be able to tell what is the good, the, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. 
And it's right after that in three where it tells you that not to think too highly of yourself. Think soberly. Because each one of us has been dealt the measure of faith. That's how powerful the word is. That he needs to remind you. That it's the presence of God that lives in you that's doing this crazy awesome work that's taking place in your life and around you. That he reminds you. Let me ask you something. I ask myself this a lot. Did I need to be reminded this week because it was just so amazing? It was just so awesome. All the things that God was doing in my life and around me. That it was trickling over onto other people. And I needed to be reminded that's not me, it's him. Because a lot of times, we don't even remember what our week had in store by the time the next week comes. A lot of times the testimony is that, that I hear is I'm tired and I'm weary and I'm sleepy. And I just want to get through this day. The weekend's coming. If we lived with an understanding that man now reigns, from the kingdom of heaven, every day would be special. There would be opportunity, even if it was just to enjoy the day, you would enjoy it differently. Isn't that neat? Rather than being focused on the, on the lack and the shortcomings, you got faith in something, it's going to be tested. Count it joy. Even Christ learned obedience to the things that he suffered. I don't know if you know this, but he's a victor. And so are you in him. Isn't that cool? And so it's not a beat down. It's not you're going to suffer because you love God and that's the way that it is. You're going to see through these things. I think it was uh, Kenneth Hagin, he said something along the lines of, I truly in my heart hurt for someone who has lived life and never had to be fully dependent on God. Because they didn't get to experience that. And it's amazing. But oftentimes we look at it as the lack or the shortcoming, the coming against. What's been made available to us is to have a different perspective. But again, it's our choice. God's given us the ability to believe or the ability to, to have faith in this. He's, he's given this to us. And he's given us his word to build this up inside of us. We have to choose to believe it or not. It's up to us. Um, flip over to Romans 5 real quick. And we'll come back to this here in just a minute. As people are turning, we talked last week about, you know, our, our identity, who we are. An exact duplicate, um, you can read in, in Genesis and see where we was made in his likeness and his image. Again, these are things that are known here. You know, Jesus talks about a, a prophet not being accepted in his own town, in his own city, right? Why? Because cause he was a common man in that sense, right? The trouble with getting so much stuff up here is it becomes a common thing and you just pass it off. Rather than grab a hold of it and let it become common in here. Does that make sense? And it's just something that it's almost like, yeah, we're hearing the same thing over and over and over again. But the truth of the matter is we'll continue to hear it until we start living it. Because once you live it, you start to believe it. Does that make sense? And the more that you believe it, the more that you live it. Um, a couple weeks ago I shared the, the, the more of God you know, the more of God you will show. Like, the more of him you get in here, the more that you are going to reflect, right? And so, understanding who we are is of the utmost importance to be able to, to start living life. And understanding that the old man died. The man that was born of this world died with Christ on that cross, because he was born of the seed of sin, and sin dies at the cross. And so the life that you live now is him living through you. He's alive, and so are you. You have access to that same place where he's at. He is your brother. 
There's a word that uh, we'll probably cover here in a minute. So I might try, try not to get ahead of myself. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, because you choose by that gift that God gave you the ability, right, to say, Jesus, though many have not seen him, right, Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross in my place. He went to the tomb in my place. He conquered death, hell, and the grave in my place, right? He resurrected. He's sitting at the right hand in my place. Like this was something that he'd done for you. Does that make sense? And you believe this by faith, and you have been justified. It says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's that peace that I was talking about a while ago. You now have peace, true peace to access the throne room. True peace, boldness, confidence that God loves you. He loved you so much. This is that agape love. He loves you so, so much. He wants to please you. God wants to please you. It's going to take a minute for that one to soak in. He does, though. And he's telling you it's impossible for him to do so without faith. And he's telling you that if you will understand this and that you will believe that he is and that you will diligently seek him, that he will reward you. Isn't that a beautiful message to receive? That God loves me? And he wants to please me. And he wants to reward me. Man, that's a game changer. And it says, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. You have access by grace, right, in which you stand. Where are you standing? You still standing down here trying to solve a first world problem with a second, or a first heaven problem with a second heaven answer? Whenever Jesus is in the third heaven sitting up there saying, I have finished. A lot of times the enemy loves to come in and bring in all these demonic names and influences and strongholds and all these things to come in and try to get people to operate in another manner. He fulfilled all things. He finished all things. He completed all things. And he is sitting at the right hand. And that right there is our access. And that right there is how we are to reign. You need knowledge about something supernatural, that's where you need to get it from, not the second heaven. We have total redemption. It says, faith into this grace in which we stand. This grace has given you access. I think it's in 2 Peter. Um, I'll just, I'll flip there and read it real fast. You can write it down and go to it later if you want. I said I'll flip there real fast. 2 Peter 3.18, it says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Grow in that grace and that knowledge. This access, this grace has given you access to grow in the knowledge of God. His knowledge is available. It's right here at your fingertips. The only thing keeping the body from growing is a lack of truth being presented. It is. If I tell you that God wants to please you, and he tells you that it is impossible for him to do so without faith, and that he wants to reward you, it's impossible to do so if you do not believe that he is and that he does reward. His word tells you these things. Does it not make you want to dig so that way you can partake of that, of that promise? But if I tell you about something that you've already took partaken of, and that's about the cross, and you understand that at some point, the words that I speak become monotonous. They don't pierce the heart. These are things that you already know. These are things that no longer entice you to grow, and you become stagnant. I'm speaking of myself. And that's what happens. This thing is always producing more. 
revelation continuing to pour in. But we have to be willing to grab a hold of it. We have to be willing to dive in to receive it. It says, in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love, remember what we was just reading about the love? Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. God's love gave us access. God's love, through what he done with Jesus, made it available for us to access the throne room. And that love is not perfected in us until we understand that he is, and just as he is, we are to be in this world. Is that not awesome? That's how his love is perfected. We just get a taste of it whenever we understand that Jesus died for our sins. We just get a taste of it. But his love is perfected when we become like him. Just as he is in heaven, so are we in this world. If you was fortunate enough like I was to have a good dad, I'm sure one of the biggest things, one of the most meaningful things I could say to him is whenever I grow up, I want to be just like you. When, that should be our mindset whenever it comes to our father. When I grow up, I want to be just like you, dad. But we can't do that if we don't understand what's available to us. This, guys, is your inheritance. Isn't that awesome? It is your inheritance. This has been given to you. Just as he is, so are you in this world. Right now. It says, for when we were still without strength. Now, this is going to come back and confirm this again. Like we've seen it once. But right here in Romans 5, it's going to show us this again. It says, for when we were still without strength. So he just got done talking about the love. He's talking about the grace. And now he's saying, when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone might even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us, that agape love, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We understand that in the sense of God loved us so much that he gave his son. But he says, much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What God has done, and he comes back at the beginning of this, and he tells us here again, that there is peace with him. There is peace with him. Access him. Access the holies. When you screw up, don't run from him. Run to him. Take it to him. Because by doing so, his son did not die in vain. He says, for, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. By his life. You are called to live through him. And not only that, but we, or, yeah. And not only that, but we, all, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Think about it like this. If you had... Somebody say, um, I don't know, it was a, an enemy, all right? Just say it was an enemy. You guys did not get along, Hatfield and McCoy kind of thing, like there was, a, you know, a, a big grudge there in the heart, right? And it came to a place to where there was reconciliation. Would you truly know that things were reconciled after you guys worked things out if you never spoke to each other ever again, never spent any time with one another ever again? There really, there would be no proof of any type of reconciliation. It would show more of an unforgiveness inside of your heart for either yourself or them because of some sort of shame not even wanting to be present around them. And it would look a lot like 
the, the major grudge that took place for years prior to. Does that make sense? And so if we understand that reconciliation, we will understand the purpose for coming and basking in his presence. We will understand the purpose for coming and spending time with him. We will understand the purpose for wanting to grow in his knowledge and in grace. Isn't that neat? We hear it here. And we might have pieces of that knowledge here, but is it here? This is what is truly given to us for access into the Holy of Holies. Now think about how powerful that is. Cliff was just talking this morning about Peter in the shadow and people being healed. You understand in the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, that if they walked in and there was sin and no blood, they was dead. That's the powerful presence of God in the book of Acts with Ananias and Sapphira. The presence of God was manifest here in this world to the point that they was living in the Holy of Holies. They understood this. And whenever sin tried to present itself and mock, they fell over and breathed their last. There's no fear in love. Don't freak out. But what I'm saying is, this has been made available for us. This is the type of ability, the being made able. This is the type of ability of the footprint that this ministry can make in this community. That's power from the kingdom of heaven. And I think it's great that we get excited whenever we see people healed. I do. But I want it to become the norm. That's the access point. So, who are we? Who are we truly? We are the express image of Jesus Christ here in this world. We are. We are the reflection of him. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, or in, in heaven as it, or however it is. In earth, you being made of earth, or on earth, however you want to look at it here in this world, but you being the image of of him the fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven the fulfillment of the types and shadows that we've seen in the old testament you have access you operating in the fullness of what god has made available fulfills the work that christ done on that cross it doesn't just stop at the cross it's the beginning of life and through that, you get to taste God's love being perfected in you. Is that not beautiful? That love being perfected. That love is perfected when we start accessing what's been made available and start operating just as he is in this world. That's a lot to chew on. So I'm not going to share any more on it. We're going to spend some time this week digesting this because that's in one spot and it confirms it in another and we've got more to cover that it's saying the exact same thing. And so if you struggle with accepting what it is that's truly made available, spend this week asking the Lord to open up your eyes, open up your heart. When you come into a corporate gathering of believers you should walk out of here different than when you came in, and it shouldn't be beat down, it shouldn't be questioning, it shouldn't be in lack, it should be elevated, lifted up, encouraged. And that's what I want to see. When you leave out of here to know God's got something in store for you, maybe you're going through something. That's awesome. In the time that you have a word that's been given to you, to continue to stand in a place of joy, not here, but here. If it's not there, spend time with him. Press into him. Make that exchange, that yoke exchange. Set down your yoke. Take up his. Make that exchange. Walk away from that time of meeting with him different, and don't walk away prior to. 
Don't walk away until that exchange is made. It's just logos until you start applying it. That's all it is. It's a lot to read this week, isn't it? Stuff to study, stuff to pray about. If you're struggling with it, get into it. Pull up these scriptures. Get a hold of me. I don't care. Show me where I'm wrong. Let's do that. Find it in there where I'm wrong. It's a word. We're just reading it straight out. Brother Cliff, you got anything you want to add? No? I love you guys. Thank you for uh, your pursuit after truth. And next week, hopefully we can, uh, we can dig a little bit deeper um, into the truth side of things and the word also. All right? Love you. Have a blessed week. And do not let this fall to the wayside. Go in there and cultivate this seed, guys. Give it a chance to grow inside of your heart. Have a blessed week.